Uh, hi, my name is Jeff. Uh, let's init this process. So, I like technology. Specifically, I like to build artificial intelligence systems that sort of mimic the things that exist in the natural world. Uh, I like animals. I like biology. Uh, I happen to own that adorable French bulldog. Uh, and believe it or not, I like humans. I spend most of my day not writing code, but actually working as a manager of data scientists and software engineers. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is how we can build technology that learns from biology, uh, that serves us as humans. And so the context I want to work on that problem is deep learning. Uh, so to explain what deep learning is, I need to explain what machine learning is, in case none of you are, any of you are not familiar with what machine learning is. Basically, all it means is that we're going to learn from data in some way. We're going to improve our performance on a given task with exposure to greater data. Um, and so artificial neural networks are one approach to building up models of that data. And deep learning is the hottest technique within that subfield. Here's what a deep learning model looks like. This is a model of how to recognize handwritten numeric digits. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of complex. This is a program uh, that has all sorts of decisions made about its architecture. Specifically, you can see many different layers. I'll zoom in so that you can have some idea of what's in a layer. Uh, and so here, uh, you can see a zoomed in picture and we can see functions that we're applying and parameters here. So at this level of thinking about the structure of a neural network, which is our, our, our problem for today, when you think about the topology, the arrangement of the layers, the hyperparameters, how did we figure out what those, uh, what those layer settings are going to be, and the actual weights that they learn, those, those parameters themselves. Um, working with deep learning tooling is actually really hard. Uh, it's, it's not an easy story, and, and I'm going to talk about some of those problems in this talk, because our context here is the bleeding edge, and it's, it's ugly in all sorts of ways. It's difficult because it's intrinsically difficult, because it is the bleeding edge. And I want to work at the bleeding edge without getting cut. Uh, so let's see if we can find a way to do that. So I need to explain evolution to talk about neuroevolution. Um, so before I worked in artificial intelligence, I worked in fundamental biological research. And so here's my super high level summary of what evolution is, which is that we have some population of organisms, uh, and then there's a selection pressure upon this population that forces some things to live and reproduce and other things to die away um, because mother nature has a rather cruel algorithm. So let's use that algorithm on our population of deep neural network architectures, and we'll do it all on Elixir uh, just because it's more fun. So the project I'm going to show you here, uh, you can find up on my website on GitHub. Uh, it's called Galapagos Now, and it's, approach to, it's an approach to continual interactive neuroevolution using Elixir and some deep learning frameworks underneath the covers. Uh, that's kind of a lot to unpack, so we're going to take it in pieces. So the first piece I want to show you here, um, and I'm going to uh, is, is our basic evolution process. Um, hmm. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the, the main thing I want to introduce to you here is in, in, uh, in the evolution here, we are evolving over a population of deep neural network architectures. And so that's what it is. We just have a bunch of deep neural nets, and we're going to see how well they perform on a given task. And we have a, and we have a sort of way of, of calling out that we're going to iterate through multiple epochs. And so we're going to keep uh, going through a few generations and see what, how things perform. Uh, in this case, what are we showing? Um, right. And so uh, one of the things that I think important to recognize about the programming model I'm going to introduce here is we're using tasks in a very fire and forget uh, way of working. So these tasks are, are just c uh, computation, and I don't care if they finish or not. Uh, if they finish successfully, we're in great shape. Very often, they're not going to finish successfully. And I just want it to not contaminate my running process because I want to keep going. Uh, and then finally, uh, here's a slightly higher level look at what it looks like when we are performing this evolutionary process on a given neural network. And so what we're actually doing here is we're manipulating each layer. So in that first line, we're going to complexify our neural network. We're going to add out more layers. And then we're going to mutate some layers. And this is exactly how natural evolution works at a genetic level. Uh, and then we're even going to mutate inside each layer. And we're going to screw with the parameters and just see how things turn out in our evolutionary process. This gives you a slightly uh, more detailed look into a completely naive implementation of mutation at the layer level. And so this is just flipping things around based on the data that we see in there and trying to see if, if these new hyperparameters and, and layer uh, functions are somehow uh, a better fit for the model that we're working upon right now. So I want to layer in a little bit more uh, biological knowledge into this context. So one of the things you observe in biology is that ecosystems do not have singular solutions. 
inside the sea, we do not simply see octopi, but actually we also see sharks. And so those are both valid solutions for how to survive and reproduce within that ecosystem. Uh, most machine learning techniques are a little bit more simplistic than that. Uh, let's use one that is more tolerant of that. Specifically, we're gonna implement an algorithm called multidimensional archive of phenotypic elites, map elites, which is really an approach to collecting up multiple solutions which are themselves elite in some dimension, but not within a single dimension. Uh, here's our selection process to show us that we are, uh, we're gonna go through, and uh, we're, what we're going to select for here, the dimension that we're concerned with, is complexity. And so I define complexity within this context to mean the number of layers we are using within our deep learning architecture. So this is how complex our program is, which is a sort of proxy for how expensive it's going to be at runtime in terms of CPU and of, and of memory both. And so we're going to actually look for multiple possible solutions along a spectrum of, of different levels of complexity, all of which need to be elite in terms of their performance of classification accuracy. Uh, and here is an example of, of what one round of selection might look like. So that one and that two there indicate levels of complexity. So these are uh, the, the first neural network there is our simplest one, and the second one, which runs off the page, is our more complex neural network. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the actual neural network is there in just a bit. Um, but first I wanna add just a few more features to the application. Uh, first is that I want to do continual learning. Continual learning is one of those uh, concepts that has a, a number of redundant names. In particular, uh, it can also be known as uh, never-ending learning or lifelong learning. In this context, all I'm really trying to do is take advantage of the power of the beam to build high, avail high availability, long-lived processes, which I can then uh, make, in, continue to interact with over a period of time. Uh, so here's how we kick it off in our sort of sample existence, uh, sample example code. Uh, so it's just a task, and so it continues to run out there, and then it itself spawns off other tasks, uh, which may or may not complete successfully, and we can just interact with that and check on it. Uh, here's the implementation of how we do that. So we're taking advantage of the fact that we have a higher order function to define how we transition from epoch to epoch. And so in the previous implementation, I used the higher order function of decrement. Here, uh, we're actually just using the identity function to indicate infinite loopings. And this means that we have no expectation of ever finishing this exploration process. We assume that we can keep learning on this problem forever. I kept saying interactivity because that's the real purpose of continual learning in this uh, example that I'm showing you here. Interactive evolution is a technique that uh, is not very widely known, but is really, really interesting because it respects the unique uh, properties of human intelligence and gives us a way to inject human intelligence within the learning process. Uh, so the image on the uh, left there is called Joyous Lord of Bones. I sculpted him in collaboration with an evolutionary AI one night on my iPad. I was thinking something like Rattle Shirt from Game of Thrones meets the smiley emoji. Uh, the more colorful images there on the right are from uh, the canonical implementation of interactive evolution in a system called Pick Breeder. And so these, these images were not drawn. They were simply discovered by an evolutionary process guided by human beings who were saying, oh, that picture looks interesting, and that picture looks interesting. And we guide through this process to, uh, to discover all of these uh, beautiful and interesting images that have never existed before. And so that's what we're gonna try and do here. A lot of the decisions within this uh, evolutionary process are being made by the, the shape of the ecosystem and by the parameters we set and, uh, and th through a completely autonomous learning process, now we have the ability to inject back in human intuition. Uh, so again, we're, we're, in, we're, we're running infinitely in a sort of continual learning context. And so one of the most trivial things we can do is we can alter the shape of the ecosystem. So uh, using Confex, there's all sorts of uh, configuration parameters that are set. Uh, within the learning process, but then you can interact with them at runtime by just passing in new values. In this case, what we're doing is we're going to broaden out the range of complexity levels we're searching for to open up the possibility of finding more and more complex models uh, because we've now decided in the middle of a training process, uh, not through some like batch job, but just while still learning, this is gonna get picked up in the next round of evolution. We've altered the ecosystem. We've, we've induced a climate change. Um, the other aspect of interactivity is that we can record out highly successful points within evolution that we think are uniquely valuable. So this uh, trivial, boring little agent here, it serves the purpose of a model library. So this is a hall of fame of some of our greatest hits. Um, the purpose of having a model library is to be able to file away things, and that's what that first line does. It, it takes something that was recently learned, the most complex model in this case, shoves it in the library, stores it away, and at any later point within the evolutionary process, we can pull that model back out, 
reintroduce it into evolution, what I call unevaluated here, and it gets a free pass. So it gets to enter back into evolution. And so to explain like why you would want to do that is I use a metaphor that this is the Jurassic Park scenario. So what we've done is we found this incredible example of evolution, a T-Rex, just a king of all dinosaurs, and we've shoved it in amber, and we're going to later pull it out and reintroduce it into the evolutionary population. And what we want to know is uh, there are two possible scenarios. Are we going to wind up with uh, some horrible half-human, half-dinosaur hybrid uh, that uh, works as a lawyer uh, down on Wall Street? Or are we going to be in a scenario where dinosaur eats man and woman inherits the earth? Uh, so that's, that's what we want to see when we in reintroduce a, a T-Rex within the population. That's a metaphor. I want to get a little bit more concrete about what the T-Rex is. To do that, I need to define a little bit more of the evolutionary concepts we're implementing within this algorithm. Specifically, I need to talk about genotypes. So in a biological context, a genotype is simply the genetic information about a given organism. Um, and this is meant to contrast with a phenotype, which is the, uh, the combination of the genotypic information and the environment. And so that is your resulting appearance, your behavior, the actual organism's properties, rather than its potential as encoded within the genotype. What are genotypes for a neural network? Here's my V1 effort. Uh, there's things I like about it. Uh, you've seen this before. And so in particular, I talked about it. It's really just a collection of layers. And layers are encoded as uh, in this sort of Lispian uh, data is code, code is data way that you see here. And so these are functions in the first position and then a list of arguments that we're going to send out there. And that gives us the ability to perform that uh, layer level mutation I showed you to where we can select different functions for our activation function within a dense layer. And then to be able to alter parameters like the, the size of the layer, the amount of regularization or dropout or something like that. So this is an elixir solution. I like it. Uh, I, I like that it you know, ties into some of the Lisp roots. Uh, and it looks like this is a pure elixir if you just glance at it at that level. Uh, so let me show you the cheat. Uh, here, as you squint a little bit, you can start to see that, oh, actually all of these functions are defined within the Galapagos Now library itself, and all they're doing is they're calling out to Python code. Uh, these are calls uh, via export, which sits on top of URL port, which sits on top of ports, to be able to call down to Python code. So as Andy feared, uh, and I'm, I'm going to make this as quick as possible, oops, uh, there is in fact Python code here. And so we have to make these calls out there, and we have to modify and write Python code, because uh, what we're doing here is we're calling down to Apache MXNet, uh, which is a powerful polyglot deep learning framework, uh, but we're calling to it via its uh, Gluon Python API. So all these functions are things that I had to write. Uh, and I don't like having to do that uh, for a number of reasons, uh, in part because uh, the uh, the bleeding edge has all these properties. This is going to be wasted work. This is a fast-moving library. I, it may not look like this tomorrow, and I have to understand a lot of properties about its parameters uh, and, and well-formed calls, and I have to write all that in the Python, and, and that's entirely what I was trying to avoid in the first place. I wanted a higher level to operate. So here's the picture of our tech stack at this point. Uh, the things at the bottom and asterisks are future work, but briefly what we're doing is we're using Elixir, calling down to a deep learning framework, which itself, of course, is written in C, C++, uh, with bindings exposed on the top. The, the bindings we're using are the Gluon Python ones. Um, and then, of course, we use some interop technologies there. Uh, one thing to note is deep learning frameworks are a pain to keep up with. They're really hard to install. Uh, the only way to really play around with this effectively in a normal development environment is to use Docker. And so I publish Docker images to allow people to do that. All right, so uh, those are our genotypes. We're I talked about models. Um, some models are actually really classic points in, in evolution. They're, they're just these great achievements of computer science research. They come largely from big tech companies and sometimes from academic research, but sometimes they are the result of months of training on clusters of GPU at an expense that no one in this room can afford. And so we can't reproduce these things. We need to be able to download them and we need to be able to interoperate with them in our programs. And so that's where we get our T-Rexes from. There's a recent change within this part of the tool chain uh, that has made this a whole lot easier for other tool, uh, for people who are working on deep learning to work with this part of uh, deep learning models in general in other languages, and that, that is the Open Neural Network Exchange format, Onyx. And so Onyx is basically pure protobuf. It's just an interface definition language uh, representation here. Uh, this is actually hundreds of lines. I'm just showing you a few of them. Uh, but this is language agnostic. We can build uh, any sort of interoperation, interoperation with this data structure in any arbitrary language because it's, it's expressed so cleanly. Uh, so now we can grab uh, a model like the one I showed you uh, that we've been operating on, the, the one in the initial slides there. Uh, and we can just pull that out from, uh, get it off the internet. And using this simple library I wrote called Onyxess, 
we can uh, decode that structure into Elixir data types so that we get a struct which we can then operate on as a first class citizen within our program. Uh, so we can begin to interoperate, so we can begin to change the structure of the neural network inside our Elixir program. What I really want to do with it, of course, is, is mutate things. And so you can see here, I now know things about the shape of the neural network because I can count on the structure of the struct there. And so what we're doing here is we're actually just going through and we're mutating the parameters themselves, something that I couldn't show you in the first part of the talk because I didn't have a way to actually get down to that level of the model. Uh, but now, uh, using this approach, which you can find on a branch, uh, I can do that. So I can start to randomly flip the weightings of individual neurons and see if that produces a better model. Uh, and then here is here's the actual mutation function, which is just a, a simple uh, 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 random numbers across a given distribution. And so all of this I can keep at this higher level of operation. And so I can work with neural networks within my Elixir program. So a couple of opportunities that working with this collection of different tools and trying to build solutions for deep learning point me to uh, that I think are important for us as the Elixir community to think about if we want to pursue uh, bleeding edge applications of machine learning AI techniques. Uh, here's a few real quick. One is that Onyx is really awesome to work with. Uh, it was really trivial to get started. Uh, we have the ability to start to operate on neural networks uh, within the Elixir runtime without necessarily having to do all the things that the Python deep learning toolchain does. But if we want to go that deep, we can. Remember that all, all of that uh, deep learning tooling that is commonly used is typically C or C++ code. And so we can build MixNet bindings, for example, or TensorFlow bindings or something like that um, uh, using the techniques like Shanti showed in her talk. Uh, MixNet itself already has support for uh, Go, Julia, R, Scala. All of these things are just wrapping around core functionality that is exposed, uh, that gives us the ability to, if we want to go that deep, to build out more deep learning tooling. Uh, I also mentioned that the parameters for all these models are, are not really easy to look up. It's not within the uh, dynamically typed Python implementations. You can't really pull it out of the docs. You just have to do, use the Erlang let it crash functionality. Uh, so this gives us the ability to uh, given that we have a high availability runtime that gives us the ability to contain our failure, uh, we can learn things about the actual parameters that uh, given neural networks uh, will accept uh, that are much harder to evaluate, even in the native tool chain of Python. Um, similarly, uh, we don't actually have to implement all the interesting functionality of performing model learning at the Elixir level to get power from operating on on machine learned models. Uh, there's things like just serving, so just performing predictions, which needs to be, happen very fast and often highly concurrently. Again, I would point you back towards Shanti's talk for a, a sort of real world example of why you might want to do that. Uh, all of this would be easier if we had better numerical computation libraries accessible to us in the EVM, the, the Beam toolchain. And I'm still on the lookout for a great way to do that so that we can do something like the Python toolchain did with the Cython dialect uh, that created that sort of virtuous cycle that has uh, led to its preeminence within the field of deep learning. And then an end goal to think about is that the Beam is an incredible runtime for executing multiple tasks at the same time, keeping them highly available and containing our failure. Uh, an ultimate end state for that could be machines which think and observe and interact in the real world. That is, robots that make decisions and learn over time. Uh, we have some great tooling that will allow us to support that if we can start to work with machine learning a little bit better. So I need to terminate the, this process um, real quickly. You can get 40% off all Manning books with this code, uh, not just mine. If you're interested in mine, it's in Scala. It's all about machine learning architectures. There's also Sasha Yurek's book and Benjamin Wentai Howe's book, which are all about Elixir. Uh, if you liked my talk, you will definitely like these two books, which dive deeper into how we can implement uh, various aspects of evolution and some of the, the core algorithmics behind it. And with that, I'm out of time. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Really appreciate it. <laughs>